the ones who are not so much familiar with you know what non-formal means and what micro credentials means but this is what we will reveal today so my name is Rolf Reinhardt and I'm involved in a range of organizations uh, the International Council on Badges and Credentials, LinkedIn, the Union of International Associations, as well as OEB Global. And I have the pleasure to have Rupert with me. Rupert, would you quickly also introduce yourself, please? Hi, so I'm, I'm Rupert Ward. Uh, I'm from the University of Huddersfield. I'm a professor of learning innovation, and uh, I also uh, work with the ICLBC. Thanks a lot. Yeah, well, the topic is super hot, so it has to say, just recently there was a report published by OECD on micro-credentials and the value it can bring in higher education to who, what, and why. And uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview, what are micro-credentials, also because these terminologies are, are floating freely. Uh, so we consider micro-credentials something that is assessed and typically in a kind of a formal environment, um, such as, for example, in the higher education space. And um, so there are a range of definitions. So we at ICOBC also look at the definitions, of course, and are working closely with a group at the UNESCO level um, to you know, commonly agree at one stage um, a definition. But what we can see is where it goes, like uh, smaller volumes in study duration or loads, Later on, you will hear why this is so important. Then to be like more targeted, which has relevancy in particular for the employers, and to be more flexible in delivery, which of course has a lot of value for the individuals and their um, yeah work-life balance, so to say. Um, so eventually, it's not only about obtaining educational advancement and I don't know, you know, like going from a bachelor to a master, but uh, really also, you know, transfer the learning into earning uh, in terms of employability and wage advancement. And that's the big goal that we see also with the yeah, micro-credential movement. So when we look into some of the examples, you know, what um, has been research done uh, already, we see that the typical target group is more, is, so those are not the, the first time a student, so to say, you know, as you see that those are, yeah, like lifelong learners um, who, who want to, you know, like generally either learn to totally new skills or, um, you know, become better in the, in the skills that uh, they possess, particularly in fields that are advancing pretty fast huh? so in terms of the, the knowledge. But there's one overarching question, and this is the question that everyone asks who is you know, joining ICOBC and, and is in the concierge course and on one of the working groups, it's around the value. So what's the value of this digital credential or micro-credential that is issued by a MOOC or by a university, etc.? And you can see here that the value is based on several key pillars. So where we see in particular the issuer, but also the endorser. And this is what we are talking about today, you know, so how you can create a partnership between the issuer of a kind of a digital credential, also, and, and how you can refine it and add value to it via, for example, a higher education institution. And um, so this is very quickly an overview of the ICOPC network. Uh, so in principle, we are representing organizations in these pillars or groups. So what we see in terms of cross-regional initiatives, then more and more organizations who are implementing online academies, they want to get recognition in the different nations also in order to align what they are teaching to the national qualifications framework. We see international standardization um, is a big theme around taxonomies and interoperability. We see that large organizations have an even more greater interest in knowing what capabilities are inherent in their workforce. We see, of course, a lot of providers um, in the in the ecosystem, and we see a range of accredited education providers who look into yeah, like unlocking new target groups for their 
um, educational provisionings. And there's another way of how we can see that. And so it starts with the digital identity. We'll hear soon much more about digital identities of the learners, also because of there's a big movement going on at the European Commission level. Then the ceiling, so which has been like promoted as one of the key benefits of digital credentials or micro-credentials that you can see them with a blockchain. But um, what's even more interesting is the claiming, so um, how to claim it, how to make it visual, how to uh, provide access to it. And what we particularly are interested to do at ICOBC is this trans transfer um, from informal learning, so through recognition into a non-formal learning and eventually the formal uh, recognition of this non-formal learning as we'll see it very soon. So one of the key questions, of course, is um, how to do that for the so-called soft skills or as we would maybe rather refer to like the core competences of future skills. And this is something that uh, we have been looking into like quite in detail um, with one of the, the groups that Rupert is leading. Uh, so, but quickly also back to the theme of the session with the workforce uh, learning. So what we see on workforce learning is that there's a general involvement of the so-called learning experience platform. So what employers typically want to do is to lower the barriers to access learning and then also to say it doesn't matter what is the provider of that learning material. Also, is it um, like uh, whatever, you know, from LinkedIn Learning, Pluralsight, or Rayleigh, or whatever. So that's irrelevant for the, for the learner. Relevant is, does it fit to my personal ambitions? Does it fit to my capabilities that I would like to obtain? Does it fit to the occupation that I have currently or that I want to um, aspire? And um, one of the key underlying skill sets of course in order to advance one's careers is the so-called 21st century skills and um, so in order to gain them you would have a range of possibilities which your workforce um, you know developer or typical learning and development partner would combine into one system and you see that there's something happening here um, down, I uh, see like credentials, you know, partner MOOCs, MOOCs, classrooms. And this is something that we could observe, like in particular with larger organizations and big companies who reached out to business schools in the neighborhood or partially also universities said, for our leadership program, we'd like to get an external recognition. And what we thought about at ICOBC was, can we not scale that can we not create networks of partnerships and um, the big question of course is if you scale if you create these networks there's a general you know like um, danger so to say <laughs> which is that you are comparing the value of two different uh, products or items also or skills so that you basically might not be able to compare and um, one of the key themes was around the recognition of the corporate learning via ECDS credits. Would it help you to actually exchange the time that you invested in corporate learning when you enter a university and you want to do your studies? And here we have an example. Rupert, the floor is yours from the 21st century uh, skills group. And later on, we show you how we implemented it in practice thanks all so so yeah just just um emphasizing i guess some of the points that uh, rolf is making here uh, there's a need for us to address what is a rapidly changing global skills economy and um there's a need within there for interoperability and part of the reason for for breaking down um uh, achievements into component parts is to enable that interoperability to work better. But I just wanted to start with this schematic, which is basically looking at it from an employer employee relationship within the skills economy. And the traditionally that education really hasn't been set up 
to meet the needs of employers per se. It's about the learning. It's not necessarily about the earning afterwards. Okay, so what you have traditionally within the, the ecosystem is employees that have developed a set of capabilities uh, through their learning and employers that are looking for a set of competencies, i.e. being able to apply those capabilities in the work context. And there's a challenge because when employers are looking for employees, they may know that, that an employee knows in theory how to do something, they are capable of doing it, but they're struggling to match that to them having confidence in them being able to be competent to do it. And so one of the areas with the 21st century skills is looking at, is there a way of being able to translate between what you do in an educational space and what you do in a workplace so that you can move back and forward between those in a much more uh, uh, fluid way with much less barriers. So next slide, please. Oh. Uh, and this isn't just ourselves that are looking at this. This, this is an area that's that's got a lot of interest um, globally, but, but let's look at it in a European context here. Um, that there's moves in terms of simplifying and repackaging things like learning outcomes that are the traditional currency in education, uh, but also looking at it more from the competency side and looking at how you can map across. So for example, Microball uh, is an initiative that's trying to look at a, a micro-credential level uh, to do something similar to the Bologna arrangements for, um, for interoperability on educational qualifications. And then Sophia, for example, Skills Frameworks for the Information Age is trying to provide a, a global uh, language for, for skills. Okay, so there's a lot of different bits in this area. Next slide, please. Oh. Okay, but fundamentally, there remains what, what I term the comp capability competency chasm, i.e. the gap between um, what you're acquiring in, in one currency, which is learning outcomes in, in an educational spend, space and what you then need to apply in a different currency in the workplace, i.e. competency outcomes. So, so how do we map between these? How do we provide a mechanism to go from a, a qualification or a bit of a qualification to a work role and, and see how it's relevant there and then come back from a work role back into education and, and build on that? Uh, and, and what we're trying to do here is, is really enable people's talents and performance to be better measured and to be recognized as they go through the system. And in the US, for example, they talk about skills-based hiring, and it's a, a shift to a more meritocratic way of employment that people who can show they have the competencies will get employed more, okay? Um, and, and so the, the use of 21st century skills here really is, is it's as a, a bridge, as a, 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 a link table between traditional currency uh, uh, of education, learning outcomes, and the traditional currency of the workplace competency outcomes. Next slide, please. So, so when we've, we've done this work, we've looked at, okay, well, what, what 21st century skills areas do, do people um, use and they use these both in in terms of the subject that they are studying in an educational context and and the subject they're applying it to in the work context and transfer in a transferable sense in terms of acquiring um, skills that they can use in different job roles or in different educational settings and there's six main areas there so there's uh, the understanding of of the 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 topic or the or the context in which they're doing it um, so that's the, the first two there. And then the, the second two there is about actually delivering something. So delivery and solution. So coming up with ways of, of taking what they understand and the context in which it's in and applying it. And the third set there, the, the third two there, behavior and reporting is really about how we then interact uh, with ourselves and with others. Okay, so, so the third set there is about you as a person. The second set is about you actually producing something. So uh, moving towards competency, I guess, from capability, competency. And the first bit is, is conceptual about how you actually understand how you're doing that. OK, next next slide, please. Bro. OK, and then you can break these down and you, you can you can get to a, a 
reasonably granular level. So, so we've split it up into 25 skills descriptors, which we, we think cover all areas that you, you would study in education and all relevant areas, therefore, in, in an employment context. And they're made up of six areas which map to those six themes uh, from a subject specific uh, viewpoint and a set of 19 areas uh, in terms of transferable skills. Okay, so just shift on to the next slide, please, Rolf. Um, and what you can do then is you can, you can take this and you can map across to any educational qualification, any workplace role, and you can, you can start measuring what is being achieved what is the talent what is the performance so it's a bit like um when you have uh, one of these fitness devices on your on your arm and you're trying to measure your 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 physical fitness performance this is a way of measuring your skills performance what you're you're actually acquiring and what you can then use uh, and so you can do it in, in formal qualifications with credit uh credit as per what rolf was saying earlier uh, but you can also then start analysing and understanding what the um, the, the uh, learner earner is gaining out of the system and how you can then adapt that. So you can then change assessment, you can change uh, learning choices, uh, you can change pathways. So next next slide, please. So so being able to present in numbers is useful. Presenting it in 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 graphical formats are also useful because you can see where the focus is. So this example is from a, a computing uh, higher education course. And here you can see the two main areas are some background theory on computing and being able to program and apply that. OK, but there's there's um, limited self-reflection in there. So there's limited personal development. There's limited technical writing there. So there may be the communications not as, as great. There's limited business requirements. So they may be not as good as well suited to, to the workplace role. And there's virtually no innovation. OK, so if you're looking to get creative uh, uh, computer graduates, then there needs to be a different way of being able to acknowledge and, and reward and monitor uh, what skills are being developed. Next slide, please. Rob. Um, so again, you can look at this also in a transferable way. And so just a few key points to pick out on here. Again, you can see from the, the graphs what's going on, where the focus is. But just look at areas, for example, like creativity, um, uh, uh, management and leadership, uh, even ethics, uh, social learning, you know, useful, really useful skills in the workplace and in life that aren't being developed there. So it's no wonder then when somebody's coming into the workplace that there's a lot of work for the employer to do to get those people's skills up. Now, if you had a much more uh, granular and clear way of seeing how those two systems uh, work together and a way to move back and forth between the other, uh, between each, then suddenly you've got a way that um, educationalists can provide more of this ahead of employment. The employers are happy with that. And employers then, when they're looking to retrain their, their staff, can focus specifically on areas of educational development, um, which they can then move back into. So it, it makes it better for, for both those stakeholders, but also for the learner earner coming through because they're, they're being more efficient in how they're um, developing their, their performance and, and their talents. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so coming back to the, the earlier diagram, we can look at this employer employee relationship then in a different way not just about capabilities and competencies but also about qualifications and job roles and so the, the 21st century skills mechanism here as the exchange rate enables you to translate between qualifications and job roles and and through doing that translate between capabilities and competencies next slide Rolf. So that's uh, basically it. So I don't have any more slides, but uh, thank you so much, Rupert. Um, so now what we would do is to actually show you what we did. Um, I will just, you know, share my other screen with you. I just have like a lot of push notifications I have to get rid of first uh, of all. So I stop that screen and I'm sharing 
um, another screen. So another screen. So the interesting thing here now with the recognition and those of you who have, uh, you know, listened and watched carefully, you saw this one big table with the transferable skills and where could you apply them and the respective ECTS credit. So why is that so important? Uh, so and why do ECTS credits count after all? So ECTS credits are actually your entrance gate towards a higher degree or maybe even a university degree at all. Uh, so and when you look into what's important here in Europe, at least, uh, and in Germany and in France and in Italy and so on, most of the uh, traditional uh, market, so to say, you would see in most of the job openings, university study required and university study may be potentially required in that particular field. Uh, so and um, so for people like, um, you know, like family, uh, so people who have parents also who have family, uh, they cannot easily drop out of their workplace and enter a full-time university study and so on. And even it would, it might be difficult to take on a full-time or part-time uh, distance education study. So what would uh, we do at, um, as you will see in order to facilitate that, and this is just like one of the examples, you know, so it can of course also um, work with um, a range of other examples. So this is with LinkedIn Learning. Um, LinkedIn Learning, by the way, so if you don't know it, so there is a possibility that you can, um, uh, opportunity, dot linkedin.com so that you can actually take free courses yourself huh, if you want it so linkedin has has um you know opened a range of courses which you can find here also huh, opportunity.linkedin.com and yeah so it's something where linkedin said okay there's a potential mismatch of skills and occupational needs uh, on the labor market. And um, so there's, for example, here like project manager or so, and um, you can click on start learning. Uh, so and it would then automatically like uh, target you to um, LinkedIn learning. So I'm just now waiting until it's happening. So you can now see, so um, as a short presentation about it, and then you can uh, click here. Um, you would then log into your LinkedIn and you see that this learning path, uh, which consists of a range of courses, so has uh, something which is pretty new. So we just realized it like two weeks ago. This learning path qualifies for official academic credit at selected partner universities globally. And um, I can click here to see more. And so the interesting thing here is that a range of universities from all around the world, so from eight different countries, including the University of Rupert, with, so the University of, Hutter, uh, of, of Huddersfield, they recognize that learning path and say, if you have gone through that learning path, you can have your hours, your learning hours, being credited in combination to with you know a certain um, you know um, a certain other tasks, and we will hear from Rupert um, now how exactly that works. So Rupert, the floor. Yeah, I, was just, I was just typing in the chat, but I'll do, I'll do it on here. So okay, so so the whole point here is as as Rolf started off at the beginning talking about uh, re removing barriers okay so 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 I've written uh, a lot of work on uh, personalized learning and the key to it really is you need to be able to measure it but also you need to be able to reduce and minimize barriers so that people can make progress so in in this context what what's happening what's happening is you can go on and try something on LinkedIn learning you can try and find out about a topic if you find that that's of interest, you can complete some learning uh, with LinkedIn Learning. Having done that, you've gained something you didn't have before, and that should be recognized. OK, so so what what we're doing at the university is say, OK, well, look, if you've done that, you should now be able to demonstrate that you've got that understanding. and You can take that and you can apply that to a context and you've de developing or developed some capability and some competency that you didn't have before 
okay so um so we then say okay well prove this to us show us this activity and you can click on find out more for example and it'll show you the different examples in there um and and it gives you a um a, a specification it says okay look if you've done these courses and you do this assessment and you submit that to us and here's some extra stuff that you can look at as well to to help support you do that do that send it to us um and and we will we will take that and we will look at that as part of your application and say okay if you've done this and we can see you've done this then you don't have to do this bit of study with us uh you can you can progress quicker than you otherwise would do okay so we'll remove that barrier for you because you've shown that you've got something comparable to what what we would be asking for anyway yeah exactly and the interesting thing is of course you know that's the next stop that that we would have when you can export that certificate from the university of Huddersfield and claim it for example in xing linkedin facebook twitter etc and hence also display your capability the the ones that you have gained um just you know very shortly also towards the end before we are um, answering also your questions um so we do have a project together with the, um, the German Ministry of Education. And this is pretty interesting. You know, I would even say that Germany is super innovative here. So imagine your university being one of the stations in a lifelong learning journey. Okay, so where you have guidance and counseling, you have orientation, which skill gaps do you have? How can you bridge that skill gap? Who can help you with that? Can it be an adult learning center? Can it be an online course? Can it be access to a university, etc.? And then also the university is becoming um, like kind of validators, so to say. They are validating the gained knowledge on the higher levels of the European qualifications framework. And um, it's a pretty interesting journey that we are on. We are also talking about the role of the different stakeholders um, at our ICOBC symposium, which is on the 30th of November here in Berlin. So if you haven't registered yet, uh, please do. There's also a possibility to join online. Uh, we only have only like four spots available to join uh, on site, but it's an amazing experience and you can uh, you know, discuss with thought leaders in the field of micro credentials and also in their application also to, to the practical um, life um, on how to do that in the best and most successful way. So thanks for now. Um, let me check if we have questions in the chat. Rupert, did you? Yeah, no, I can't see any questions in the chat. No. Yeah. So no, okay. just stunned. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So what's also interesting is that if you, for example, you have a university or you're part of a university, and you say we would like to tap into issuing micro credentials, you know, like maybe to some extent um, digital credentials, but then also looking into how can we ensure the value on the job markets? Then please reach out to us. I mean, namely to Rupert, uh, who is the as you will see director of strategic partnerships, and he is doing a great job. I really have to say with you know like facilitating. Now, I mean, in the beginning, so with LinkedIn Learning, there were eight universities, but we have uh, dozens of other universities now in the pipeline. And we think of it really as an example, uh, as I said before, um, what we can do here, we potentially also can do it with other scenarios. And it might be also a step towards the mutual recognition of the different universities of the credits that they are issuing also which is uh, maybe to some extent the holy grail so thank you so much rupert uh, for joining me and also on the short notice that <laughs> you you made yourself available and uh, thanks everyone for attending uh, and i hope to see you soon and hear from you soon